What's a secret you won't share with anyone in person, but you are willing to share anonymously? Story 1. When my father was on his last day in hospital, he was asking to see his grandchildren. I took my eldest daughter, who was five at the time, to the critical care ward so I could say goodbye. What I did not tell anyone was that it was also so she can see that in the darkest ends of life there can be, massively drugged up, peace. Because there is currently no guarantee that she will even leave the education system alive, let alone have a long life. She knows she is not well, she doesn't know they don't think she has that long. Story 2. It's a small thing, but a while ago I came across a baby chick that had a broken wing and was clearly very sick and was suffering. I love animals a lot, so I decided the best thing was to put it out of its misery. I'm a full-grown man, but I cried like a bish afterwards. I know it's not such a huge thing like other stories on here, but it really hurts my heart, and I've never told anyone about how it made me cry so much. As a fellow lover of animals, know that I think you did the right thing, and I would have bawled my eyes out too. You're in good company. Well, you're in my company, so judge that how you will. Story 3. This thread is really a weird blend of lighthearted funny stories and the most depressing crap I've ever seen. Story 4. I won $250,000 in the lottery. Don't want my family to know because they will ask for money, lol. I would judge you for being selfish, but I don't know your family, so fair enough. Story 5. I don't really consider myself transsexual, but if there were a way to change my gender all the way down to a genetic level, I would do it. Story 6. When my son was first born, he developed a host of health issues. I used to hope he passed away because regardless of how much pain it caused me to lose him, I wanted him to be out of that pain. He's four months and doing much better now, but I still feel guilty for thinking that in his first month. Story 7. I'm head over heels for my brother's best friend. Have been since I was a freshman and we both go to college now. But I'm aware I'm not very attractive and he's dating someone, so I could never bring myself to get in his way. Hey, if you're really fond of him, just be the best friend you can possibly be. If the opportunity arises in the future, who knows, he may think you're beautiful. And if it doesn't, then you've still got a great friend. Win-win. Story 8. When I was in high school, I was at a carnival with two good friends of mine. We were running around and started to get a bit rowdy. When the three of us got tangled up and fell over, one of my friends bit a wart off my hand and blood started gushing everywhere. Everywhere. It didn't hurt me literally at all, but I had to put on an Oscar-worthy performance and pretend it hurt like all hell. I saw that as far more preferable than looking her in the eyes and telling her that she ate a wart off my hand. Story 9. It's not so much a secret I completely won't share, but only three people know the full truth behind it, while everyone that has suspicions can only rely on rumors. When I was 11, I met a girl at summer camp, for soccer I think. We were friends at first, but we got closer after talking more. We both felt left out of our friends, both agreed that we had too many friends, and both agreed that we would rather have one true friend. We were each other's truest friends from then on, about a month after the camp. Two years passed, during which we hung out a lot. Think about two to four hours after school, walking to a library or a similar place. I don't know about her side, but I always told my parents that I was studying with friends. They believed me since I was a relatively honest child, and I had the third highest grades in the school. We loved reading books together, either sitting across from each other in the library nook or side by side on a couch. When I was about a month away from 13, I asked her if she would go out with me. She said yes before I could even make it awkward. We were dating from then on, and it was probably the happiest I have been in my life. We weren't the couple making out in the bathrooms, but we were the couple sending coded messages through reverse pickpocketing. I am still convinced that we had similar interests to the point of identical. She and I both loved cardistry, like card tricks, lockpicking, and piano. We both loved fantasy and adventure books. We loved scary movies with friends, but Disney movies and musicals went alone or together. Literally the sappiest romantic couple, looking back. About January, which was six months before I would turn 14, she told me that she had heart problems as a child. She said that she was telling me this because she heard from her mom that they might, not definitely, but probably were getting worse. I told her that it would be fine, that she was strong enough to overcome it. That's exactly how it was. 
From February to May, she was getting better. Her doctors gave her medication, and she took it regularly. Then in June, the doctors told her, she then told me, that she was almost completely cured. On July 1st, she died of fatal arrhythmia, heart beating too fast for the body. Her father rushed her to the hospital, but by the time she got there, she apparently had severe tissue damage or some bullcrap. So they didn't try to revive her. I was in shock for a few weeks. I would find myself calling her number, writing something funny in code to give to her, or trying to text her. I kept forgetting that she was no longer there. My friends all told me, I'm sorry for your loss, or I hope you get over it, or you'll still find someone. Wow, they didn't even want to know much about it. I was 14 and I started cutting. It seemed better to me, like my pain was being leaked out in pulses. I stopped cutting and talking about seven months in when we moved to a different state. I didn't talk as if I wouldn't respond to small talk, didn't see a point, and would only respond to direct questions that weren't too sensitive, e.g. what is your name. Eventually, I tried to move on. It was a year later when I was 15 that I tried using my voice and smiling. Couldn't really do either well. My voice was hoarse and smiling kind of reminded me of her and it looked fake even to me. I tried to talk and the therapist was happy because she thought the meetups helped me. They didn't. I was trying to get myself up. I did, in the end, manage to get myself back on track. I started studying and exercising again. I started reading, albeit alone. It was like a part of me, a crucial part was ripped out and I was nursing the wound. It hurt more than I can describe, but overall, I think I'm mostly healed. Two things that have stayed with me were her last words, which are, I mean, I know we'll always be together. We can win anything together, right? And the nightmares. Her name was Tanya. Thanks for reading this. I'm certain some folks would argue that this person was too young to blah 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 whatever, but I really want to take this person's emotions seriously because hell, I don't know them, their emotional maturity, anything like that. And yeah, losing someone you love is a huge pain, and it does feel like losing a part of yourself, but more so folks, remember, a person that you got to spend time with and love is just a part of you now. You will never, never get enough time with someone you love but you can cherish the time you had and let it stay with you, for what it's worth. Story 10. I don't remember what age I was, but my family was out camping. My grandparents lived nearby, but were getting up there in age, so drove out instead of camping. Anyway, my grandpa was walking around the campgrounds, and I decided to go for a bike ride. I came across him, and he was smoking, to my knowledge then, and to this day nobody in the family knew he smoked at the time. I pulled up to him, saying something along the lines of, You don't smoke, to which he replied, Don't go telling anyone about this now. I didn't think too much about it then, but a year or two later he developed cancer, which overtook him a couple months later. It was discovered shortly after he passed that he was smoking regularly. I don't remember how it was discovered, but I do remember going to my grandma's house with my sister and mom to collect soda tabs. And inside a lot of the crushed cans were cigarette butts. It's been years and I still think about it from time to time and wonder whether if I'd said something in the first place it would have made a difference in the long run. To this day I haven't told anyone about it. Friend, family member, stranger, nobody. Until now, anyway. Story 11. I have played hentai games and enjoyed them. Story 12. We're currently in the beginning stages of planning our wedding, so the topic of what song we dance to comes up a lot. We have a song in mind already. Faithfully by Journey was the first song we ever danced to. Only, it wasn't. I remember that Faithfully was actually the second song we danced to, but I personally don't like the first one. It was so long ago now that I'm the only one who remembers the truth, and I don't want to say anything to avoid having to dance to a different song. I feel absolutely cheated by the fact that you didn't say what the other song is. Shame on you for leaving that out. Now I hope your significant other does remember and makes you dance to it. Story 13. I tell people if they ask that I lost my top set of teeth to a genetic problem, but the truth is I refused to brush them as a teenager and they all fell out in probably the worst way ever. One day, I was eating toast and my whole top set of teeth just bent out of my mouth with the bread. They didn't even break, they just bent out and I had to have them removed by a less than impressed dentist. I have to wear a denture now, I'm 30 plus, and forever too because who the F can afford implants? I'm really ashamed about that. Brush your teeth, people. Story 14. My phone password is 123465. Story 15. When you're around friends, always claim your farts. 
Hear me out. If you always claim your farts around friends, you don't mind farting around, they will think you're just unashamed about your farts. But when you go out, let's say, with a group of friends plus a hottie you're trying to score with, and you have to release a SBD bad boy from your buns, everyone's going to be like, oh my god, who emitted that toxic odor from their bowels? And they'll try to pin the blame on someone, including you at some point. But then you can say, it wasn't me, you guys know I always claim my farts. And your friends, being the naive, sweet, wholesome fools they are, will be like, that's true. Hope and Lincoln always claims her farts. I bet it was you, Becky. And Becky will get the blame, which is fine, because she's kind of passive-aggressive and probably deserved it. And you will get to take the hottie home and show him slash her a good time, eventually marry him slash her, and die with your secret. You're welcome. My god, some of you are out there trying to walk to corners or hang back from the group to sneak out farts, and OP is out there playing 3D fart chess like a master. I am humbled by your flattest foresight. Story 16. My dad was shot and killed when I was young. Over the years, I began to wonder if my maternal grandpa did it to protect our family. My dad was very abusive and threatened our whole extended family when my mom left him. A few years ago, an article was published in my hometown paper suspecting my maternal great-uncle, a former cop, of killing him. It all makes sense. Access to weapons, the ability to cover it up, the uncle has a history of being suspected of other crimes, and the fact that this great-uncle was very helpful to my mom over the years, giving money, visiting a lot when I was younger, etc. Almost like he felt responsible. My great-uncle is now dead, and my mom won't speak about it. I think she knows. Hate talking to anyone in real life about this. It's so seedy and sad. Only ever told my last long-term partner. Story 17. I love singing, but I'm too shy to do it where anyone can hear me. At least anyone here. So during downtime when I'm not studying, working, in class, or with friends, I get in my car and drive in circles around the town with no destination, belting the songs at the top of my lungs. I don't mean that I take a detour on my way home or on my way to get groceries. No. I mean I actively get up, put on my jacket, and get in my car with the intention of driving in a loop around town before returning home, having stopped nowhere. No one is going to see this since the post has been up for so long. I have a balloon fetish. Guess what? We saw it. Story 19. I really, really hate myself. I am deeply ashamed of everything I do, and I don't know how long I can keep living with myself. Folks, if you have this thought... Please talk to someone, a therapist, a family member, but talk to someone. Your brain is lying to you and needs to have a talking to. Story 20. I don't know what I want in any aspect of life and I feel like I don't have a personality. One second I'll feel strongly about something, the next moment I'll feel the exact opposite and I hate it. I'm very influenced by how other people feel and will generally do what I think will make them happy because I literally can't have an opinion on pretty much anything. Story 21. I think I'm the reason why my female friend's brother is dead. I was on the phone to her at 5 a.m. She walked into a different room and left her brother alone. He had an asthma attack in his sleep and died because of it. I constantly think that had I not been on the phone to her, she would have been in the room when the asthma attack occurred and could have done something before it was too late. This happened in 2011 and I think about it every two to three days. Story 22. I am a grown woman and sometimes can't control my bladder and pee my pants a little bit. Story 23. I pretend that my relationship with my father doesn't bother me. He was horrible to me growing up and has only really become involved with me since I had my son, who is now 15 months. He's wonderful with him, though. We only ever used to have a short conversation once every few months. He was ashamed of me. I desperately wish I'd actually had a dad growing up, but it's been such an absent thing for so long in my life, I'm not sure how I'd deal with it. Last night, my father was tagged in the picture with a girl I went to school with. She posted, The next best thing to my dad. His dad had passed away many years ago from cancer, and he was a great guy. It really made me sad that she, along with other people my age, talk about how wonderful my dad is and how helpful he is to them. I wish I knew what was wrong with me in his eyes. My baby has a wonderful father, though, and I take comfort in watching them together. That sounds like a really tough thing to even try to talk to him about, but I would encourage it. If he wants to be a part of your and your son's life, you should have open communication about issues. If he can't give you a good answer, you're within your rights to not want him in your life. 
At least with what little info I know. Why am I giving advice like I'm Dr. Fraser Crane? Story 24. That I barely hang on every day and I'd rather not be alive. Story 25. I've improved a lot over the past year, which includes getting out of depression and improving myself. The one thing that's worrying is that the call of the void has never been stronger. I ride my bike a lot and I'll never act on it, but it's incredibly intrusive. Story 26, that I isolate myself and am content with being alone and doing nothing. On the flip side, it makes me hate myself at the same time because I'm just wasting my life. I love being alone and feel so guilty for feeling that way. Cue continuous cycle of depression. I personally believe you can't waste your life. It's yours to do with as you please. If you aren't hurting anyone else, live the way you want to live. Story 27. How much I truly love my wife. People know I love her, but I really, really love her. My life is the best it has ever been because of her. I finally feel like a success, and she is the reason why I push myself. She is my rock when I feel like everything is turning to crap. I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. Story 28. Almost everything I share on here I would never utter in real life. My superpower is deflecting. The conversation will move forward, but I will not share anything about myself. One person has called me out on this. Story 29. I got S harassed constantly at the bar I worked at in high school, and I never said anything to anyone because I'm a guy and figured no one would care. Story 30. I evacuated my elementary school with a single fart. When I was in elementary school, I would fake sick all the time just to stay home. But eventually, my mom decided that the only way I could stay home was if I had a fever because I've cried wolf too many times. One morning in sixth grade, I had a killer stomach ache, and I tried my hardest to convince my mom to let me stay home by crying my eyes out. She tested me for a fever and said, no fever, no home day. So I sat in class trying my hardest not to cry in front of my classmates. Side note, I'm notorious for having horrible farts. Each one is seriously like a jar of sulfur with rotten eggs inside that was baking in the sun for six hours just got opened. I blame my grandma because her farts smelled just like mine. Anyways, I'm sitting in class about halfway through the day when I feel the fart coming. I held it for a minute, but it didn't go away, and my butt muscles were tired, so I finally decided to release it and hope for the best. Luckily, it was silent, but a lot of gas came out. It seriously lasted for like a second and a half. Instantly, I felt better, but then I caught a whiff of it and almost gagged. It didn't smell like my normal farts, but I could still tell it was mine. The girl next to me smells it next and noisily stands up and walks backward, looking everywhere with a disgusted face. My class just kind of looks at her confused. Then my fart hits the kid in front of me in the face and he screams, Ew, what is that smell? My teacher stands up from his desk and walks over to the kid, but before he gets to him, he smells it and his face tenses up and he pauses for a second before saying, All right, everybody, it smells like the school has a gas leak. I need you all to cover your noses with your shirts and walk out onto the field just like a fire drill, okay? So we all stand up, cover our faces, and walk out of the classroom and onto the field. My teacher closes the door behind us and runs down to the administrative office. So we're out on the grass, sitting where we normally go during a fire drill when the school's fire alarms go off. I watch all these people, all my friends, coming out of the doors and walking onto the grass. I'm silently watching as teachers take roll, and I sit there as the janitor puts on one of those blue face masks and runs in to make sure no one is in the bathrooms. I hear multiple sirens approaching and just watch as two fire trucks and one ambulance arrive and shortly after our D.A.R.E. officer. I just watch in pure embarrassment as a few firefighters in full gear walk into the school, presumably heading for my classroom to run some tests while some teachers hand out otter pops someone just got from the Walmart down the street. All the parents were called, and most came down to the school and took their kid home by the time school was supposed to get out. My mom came about an hour after the fire trucks arrived and checked me out at the table and list they had set up. On the way home, my mom said, What an eventful day! I bet you're sure glad you went to school today, aren't you? I vowed to myself that I would never feel embarrassment like that again by sharing this story. But given the anonymity, I feel like this can be an exception. 
truly a fart for the ages. I don't know how old you are now, but that is the kind of story you share with friends at the bar and all have an amazing laugh. Don't feel shame. Feel pride that you're apparently an X-Man with one revolting but powerful mutation. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Story 31. I'm diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. I refuse to tell anyone. Hospital people, psychiatrists, yeah, they know, but nobody else. I know the stigma behind the diagnosis. I know how many people, online and offline in the world, view the diagnosis, and I'll be damned if I'm going to let anyone label me as a manipulative or emotionally abusive, just because they think that's what it means. I don't care if that's not how it officially is. How people think it is, that's the important part. Story 32 one time, I accidentally dropped the keys to my golf cart in a porta potty and had to stick my hand in there to fish them out. It was the afternoon and had been used all day by a huge tournament. I thought of just burning my arm off afterwards. Story 33. I'm gay and suicidal. Those are two really uncomfortable conversations I'm not willing to have in real life. Willing or not, you should have them. Be safe about it and have them with people you can trust, but have them. Coming out is hard as hell, but doing it with friends can be the best feeling in the world. Of course, only when you're ready, but if it is making you feel self-harming, you need to talk to someone. Story 34. I ran over someone's dog once because he bolted off into the streets full speed and I couldn't stop without crashing into four other cars. That was two years ago, and I still think about it. Story 35. In the beginning, I like to behave as a different person by just using a different style of clothing. Today, I have perfected it by using wigs, makeup, and other stuff to the point that even my friends think that the other girls they met weren't me. It's part fetish and part curiosity, but there is nothing better than to be a different person for an evening. To interact with people who know me normally, and it's an option to be someone I can't be. So far, only my best friend knows it, and he likes it. Many people wonder how he has a different girl on his side every afternoon he visits. Story 36. If some information about myself that I'm not even willing to talk about here comes out, I'm pretty much ready to throw myself off the fifth floor. I haven't harmed anyone or done anything illegal, but it would change people's opinions of me in a way that I don't want to endure. Story 37. I think I'm in love with my best friend. Story 38. When I was three, I convinced two other kids in my preschool to poop in a log with me. We all got suspended for a week. I feel like that's less of a secret than you might think. I feel like whoever suspended you has told that story to plenty of people. I feel like you should tell that story to plenty of people. It's funny. Story 39. I'm a bi-curious guy, which basically just means I'm not sure if I'm bisexual or not. Here's the thing, I've had crushes on guys before, and even to this day, if I see a cute guy, I get giddy inside. But the problem with me not being open is that, based on my interactions and experiences, women really aren't in to buy guys. Real life example, I had this openly bisexual teacher who was a major heartthrob in my class. A lot of the girls and some gay guys had crushes on him, but time and again, I always heard, if so-and-so wasn't bi, he'd be dateable. Or, he's bi? Too bad. So hearing stuff like that kind of dissuades me from being open, because it's not that I like guys only, I like girls too, maybe even more so, and I don't want my chances with women to drop just because of preconceived notions that can be avoided. Another thing is, I've never really had a romantic or physical relationship with a man, so I can't really be sure if that's something I want. So for now, I'm just secretly bi-curious and will only tell another person if we're in a relationship. Okay, folks. I'm pansexual, been with people of all genders, and I had a woman I was interested in act a little grossed out that I had been with men as well. Which was great. Wanna know why? Because I don't want to date someone who thinks that being bi or pan is a turnoff. That woman saved me time in pursuing a relationship. So, get out there and sate that curiosity, my friend. Story 40 Sometimes when I'm downstairs and everyone is asleep, I start to feel like I'm being watched by something and it makes me feel trapped in one room because I think if I move into the next room, the thing watching me is most likely going to hurt me, whatever it may be. I also get really bad intrusive thoughts like, oh, just burst your eyes open, see what it feels like. 
My psychologically abusive former husband is upset that I seem to have an ongoing supply of money to counter his legal attacks on me and to pay for school fees, orthodontics, and dance lessons for the children, which he can't afford despite living with his mother and having been paid out of his share of the house. Truth is, I published an ebook. I wrote a rollicking comedy that's 100% based on him and his zany family, and the proceeds are keeping me financially secure enough that he can do nothing to rock my boat. Story 42. I'm a 36-year-old virgin. Never been on a date, never kissed, never hugged, never held hands. Story 43. For the past eight months, some people think I'm at the brink of having a breakdown. I had an internal breakdown. It's why sometimes my eyes are puffy, why sometimes I look terrible, why I often don't get enough sleep, why I perpetually look sad. Story 44. Nice try, NSA. Ah, crap, he's on to us. Story 45. I actually really, really, really worry about how people view my relationship. I love my husband. I'm going to spend the rest of my life with him, but in a professional setting, I kind of skim over how long we knew each other before we got married. Because if they knew it was only six months, I feel like they wouldn't trust me to make good decisions anymore because of stigmas. We're both mid-30s, so it's not unheard of, but still. Story 46. Last year, a kid was bullying my daughter at school. I went to the teacher and then the school office and nothing was done. I found a very large kid in her school and paid him $50 to beat the stuffing out of the bully and tell him to leave my daughter alone. No more problems from the little bastard that year. Okay, I wasn't on board for the reboot of Breaking Bad until now. This new take on Walter White is uh, really working for me. Story 47. I'm dying. Story 48. Guys I work with and friends are always asking me to hang out after work or on the weekends with them. I say I have plans already, but just go home to see my dog and have full-blown conversations with him. I talk about my day, life, TV shows, video games, everything. I even ask him questions about his day. I feel like if someone saw me, they'd think I'm nuts. Story 49. That I'm trans. I got a concussion for telling my family, but they don't know how far it goes. I'm going by the male version of my name, hardly a drastic change, Charlotte to Charlie, wearing binders but putting a stuffed bra over it when I'm with my family or friends, planning to get my hair cut and I wear boys' clothes when I'm out of the house. My therapist knows a little. My best friend guessed it, lol. Here's hoping you get enough space between you and your family to fully explore that and live your truth. Charlie, it's a pleasure to know what I hope won't be a secret for much longer. Story 50 on a more lighthearted note, I'm in a top 10 law school taking on a considerable amount of debt after already paying off undergrad loans, but I like what I'm learning, and I don't think this was a mistake. There's so much negativity online about going to law school, and many of my peers complain constantly about how much law school sucks, but I like it, and I'm grateful to be here. Story 51 Throw away for obvious reasons. My cousin dated some abusive guy when she was 20 or so. Everyone in my family knew he was, but nobody really did anything. We tried talking to the police, but since she denied it, nothing could be done. We live in a European country, not sure what the laws are in the U.S. I'm not on the greatest terms with my extended family. Nothing major, we just never saw eye to eye on politics and things like that. I'm liberal, but they are religious in a secular country and somewhat conservative. Although not American conservative tier, they still support things like gay rights. So I never got close to them growing up. But one night, she calls me crying her eyes out, telling me she can't reach my aunt, her mom, or her dad, and that her husband had gone further than before. I'm not going to detail it here, but it went further than the usual slap the family often ignored and just got peed about. I go to pick her up, tell her it's all right, all that stuff, and I leave her to sleep over on my couch. But as the night goes on, I just get madder and madder. I'm not close to my cousin, as I've said, but this is someone I grew up with. Our parents arranged for us to play together as little kids, and I couldn't get over how this butthole kept hurting her and nobody was doing anything about it, just hosting her on their couches and talking behind their backs about it at family gatherings when wasted enough. So in the early hours of the morning, I went back to her place and beat her husband damn near to death. I've always been a big guy, but he hasn't been the same since, and she broke up with him a few weeks afterwards since he couldn't really lay his hands on her at the time while healing. She knows what I did because she asked me what the hell had happened when she saw me the next morning with my hands all torn up and face busted, but I just said I'd gone to my boxing gym before she woke up, 
and we didn't talk about it anymore. She's with another guy now that's really nice to her, and they've got two beautiful kids together. We still don't really hang out except for pleasantries at family functions, but she's a lot happier these days, and I don't regret what I did. Sorry if my English is bad, it's my second language. Apparently, your first language is pain. But on a more serious note, I don't really blame you for what you did. I'm not a violent person, but it sounds like you saved your cousin from a bad situation. I don't know if it was right or not, but I'm not going to argue with the results. Story 52. I want to be a comedian. I don't know how or why, but I somehow make people laugh hysterically, and it has since become a secret passion. I feel happy making people laugh at my jokes. The only thing holding me back is the fear that I will crumble on stage. As someone who used to do stand-up comedy, the fear of failure is real, but it also makes getting those laughs all the more thrilling. Seriously, the best highs of my life came from killing it on stage. Do it. Failure is just learning to do better, and it's worth it. I've been thinking about getting back into it for years. I need to take my own advice. Story 53. When I was in elementary school, I stole all the balls out of the computer lab mouse and threw them into the creek behind the school. The computer lab was closed for the rest of the school year because apparently it wasn't in the budget to buy 40 new mouse. I feel like a butthole 19 years later. Story 54. More than 20 years after our breakup, I still think about her every day. I still go to and sample her perfume every now and then in the store so I can remember her smell. Story 55. I feel so helpless. I'm a 16-year-old boy with countless chronic illnesses. Granted, that isn't a secret. I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, Dysautonomia, Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome, Mast Cell Activation Syndrome, and Sjorgen Syndrome. I never feel good, no matter what I do, but all of that aside I can accept because what's the point of being mopey about something I can't do anything about and won't ever be able to do something about? What really makes me hopeless is my family. I'm extremely antisocial and introverted as a result of my low-end Asperger's, and I feel that no one takes me seriously or actually cares deep down about what I want or think. I spend most of my time on the computer playing games either alone or with some very few friends that I have. My parents think it's a problem that I spend too much time on there, but they don't look deep enough. They only see what their arrogant, controlling eyes want to see. They think it's an addiction, yet I have proved to them many times that it's not, as if I can go weeks without it and be okay. It is one of my only ways of actually getting social interaction with my friends, and most of the time I can't even go to school because of my illnesses. And you might think, oh, maybe it's because you're not doing well in school and that's why they're mad. Nope. I've never failed a class in my life or gotten an overall average in school less than an 88. That's the lowest. The highest I've gotten is a 99 overall, and generally it's around a 94. I work my damn butt off all day despite my illnesses, and yet I still eat flack for being lazy. My home life is absolutely toxic. My sister has the same problems as me, yet she is the opposite at the same time. She is super dirty and messy, literally didn't do her homework for a year in school, failed multiple classes out of laziness, doesn't do anything around the house. Yet for some reason my parents leave her alone most of the time? Why do I ask? Oh, because we are just too tired of dealing with her. She's 18, by the way, and graduated from high school. And not even kidding, like 80% sure my sister is a sociopath. And that isn't even my biggest issue in my house. There's a lot more. My mother, I don't even have the words to describe. Don't get me wrong, I love my family as I can't not because it's family, but I think that it's my biggest weakness. I always try to make things easier for other people. I always look out for others, so if I complain or have an issue, I just bury it because I don't want to be a bother, or I'll feel bad and be guilty. I'm just tired of it. My mother is always back and forth and constantly complains. Oh, her life is just too hard and she's going insane because there's so much going on. And I get it, her life is pretty hard considering she has to work and deal with our medical problems. But when she blames others and constantly yells, it makes me want to explode. She's also irresponsible, and she is always late to things. She procrastinates and just doesn't deal with problems that need to be dealt with, such as my sister. I feel as I type this, I'm just jumping deeper down the rabbit hole of my mind, and I hate it. Next on the long list is forced friends. Last year during the summer, I met a mutual friend whose name I won't say, but he was okay. He was pretty self-centered and narcissistic. He was 15 and was a pilot and was originally from a very rich family, so I can understand, as he was an only child, how his behavior could be affected by all that. 
so I talked to him a little, but we weren't good friends, just mutual. But I mentioned him to my mom, and she seemed pretty interested, and I didn't think much of it. I don't even know where it went from here, because I think there's so much in my mind that some of it just gets lost. But next thing I know, he is dating my sister. So that means he's at my house pretty often, and I have to see him all the time. Okay, whatever, that's cool, I can let all that slide, but eventually my sister saw how big of an attention-seeking douche he was, and that didn't go well, because my sister is also one, so you can't have one stealing from the other. My mom had grown attached to him, though, as his parents had a divorce and his mother was a little crazy. Wow, wonder how that feels. And he grew attached to her, too, and he was looking for a mother figure. When my sister wanted to break up with him, she couldn't because it would be too awkward considering my mom and him were so close now. Like, they were very close. They would talk on the phone during the middle of the night for hours. They would go for car rides together and have car talk, which is where he opened up to her and, ooh, boo-hoo, his mother is crazy. Suck it up. Don't make your problems cause more problems and affect others like me and my family. Pretty much my sister eventually broke up with him, and that didn't go well at all. My mom thought it was a great idea for us to be friends too, so he was constantly over here and sleeping over in my room because I felt too bad saying no. He would keep me up until 3 a.m. on school night and talk about how much he loves my sister and how much of a good friend I was and what he would do without us. I just went with it because I thought it would make my mom and him happy and that's all I wanted was for everyone to be happy. This went on for about a year, and about uh, two months ago, I snapped, and I barely even talk to him now because I can't stand him. I would talk about what happened in that year, but I've shoved it so far down I can barely remember, and besides, it's a year worth of crap, so this comment is already long enough. <clears throat> I'm just going to interject here and say that he might say that it's already long enough, but we're only halfway through it. <clears throat> anyway, back to it. Pretty much I only have one good friend and I've known him since kindergarten. He's the main person I play games with because I feel like I can actually trust him. Oh yeah, trust issues. Trust? What's that? My house is super small and the walls are paper thin so any noise that is made can be heard easily. So whenever I talk to anyone I feel like I'm being listened to and I get super buggy and paranoid. My parents are very intrusive so they will constantly check my internet history, my phone and other stuff so you can tell I'm very paranoid. I used to trust other people and I would tell them things so I would go out of my mind but then they would blab so I stopped trusting pretty much everyone. My father, I don't even know how I feel about him. I will talk a bit more once I get into the whole religion thing but I guess outside of that I just see him as a spineless pushover who just goes along with everything my mother says because he's too scared that she will get mad at him. Okay, now getting into religion. I was raised as a Baptist Christian my whole life and I genuinely hate it. I do believe in a god, and I always have, but I hate that I know that there is one. I'm a bit competitive, so since I was little, I always wanted to prove there is a god, and I can pretty well. I'm good at debates, but deep down, I hate it. All the morals of Christianity are just bogus to me. How could a loving god send people to hell for eternity? Like, what is that? Oh, and trust me, I've heard all the explanations, but overall I've realized it's just a load of crap. But I still know that there is a heaven and hell, which scares me a lot. I would have probably killed myself by now if not for two things. One, going to hell for it, and two, I wouldn't want to cause grief to the people around me. Like, I genuinely wish there was no God, so when I die, I could just be nothingness, like a never-ending sleep. I wish every night before I go to bed that once I fall asleep, I just never wake up. Okay, now moving on from the depressing thing and on to my parents and religion. I can't voice any of my own opinions at all without being disrespectful or backtalk, yet my parents say that if I have a problem, just tell them? So what is it, tell you or don't? So I feel like I don't have a voice at all. Also, I feel like there is no tolerance for me doing anything bad. That's why I work so hard, so that I don't get in trouble. My parents always talk about God and stuff, yet they don't actually put it into practice. I feel like it's just a way to control people. They say my computer and games are my idol and that it's Satan getting to me and playing with me, but how can that be true when you do the exact same crap? I'm just tired of it all. You can tell me that I need to interact in real life more and that talking to people through the internet isn't healthy, yet I can't go to school half the time and even when I want to go see my friends, they say no. They don't approve of my friend group because they smoke marijuana and aren't Christian. They say I should be friends with Bob, a name I made up for the guy from earlier that flew planes and was a douche. Because he's a Christian and is a good influence. No, I refuse to be friends with someone who was forced into my life and that I don't get along with at all. We are the complete opposite anyway. And trust me, I tried for a year. Just this weekend, my friend invited me to stay at his house Sunday night because we have a day off Monday. So I asked and my parents said no. Why? 
Oh, because he smokes weed? Who gives a damn? He's a teenager who has problems of his own. That doesn't mean I shouldn't be friends with him and be happy. Come hell on, I'm just tired of all the garbage in my life. There's still a lot more that goes on in my mind as I have high stress levels and OCD, but I can't even remember them. My mind is like a black hole. If you read this far, I have respect for you because damn, this was long. Just overall, I feel like an empty husk that's just existing. So, OP, I don't know if you'll ever see this, but you're 16. A few years and you can, I hope, make some space from your family and see friends who smoke weed and explore life more. I promise, and I know this is cliched, but life gets better. Anyone who says their high school years are the best years of their lives are people who don't know how to live life. Stick with it, and hopefully things will get better. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.